Hello and welcome again to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and our guest in the studio today is Michael Meacher. Hi Michael. And Michael has written really a very fascinating book called Destination of the Species, uh, The Riddle of Human Existence. And we're going to talk today about his life and about his book and all the implications of his book. And it's, it's very deep. So, Michael, let's start by asking you, what was the motivation for writing the book in the first place? Well, I was brought up as a Christian. Um, my mother wanted me to be a priest, but I decided against that. Uh, but I have always uh, regularly attended church throughout most of my life, and certainly, particularly in the last 20, 30 years, uh, in the communion service, we repeat uh, the Nicene Creed, uh, which was, of course, written in the 5th century uh, AD. That's what it relates to, the struggle within the church between Arius and Athanasius, which was very vibrant at that time. But it does have no impact on today's society or civilization. And I found myself thinking, you know, if I wouldn't write this as what I believe is my Christian faith, what do I actually believe? And the book is a result. Because mm. it seemed what triggered it, triggered it was also mm. you wanted to know what mm. the meaning of life was, what the mm. whole thing about is about, because the, the planet is so complex mm. and there are different ideas, aren't there, and why why we're here? Well, of course, in the 5th century AD, uh, there was a belief that the planet uh, on which we live, the Earth, was the center of uh, the whole universe, and it's only in the last uh, four or five hundred years that we know something extremely different, and science has fantastically extended our knowledge and understanding. And the wonder, the extraordinary, unbelievable wonder of the universe. Uh, and I think, uh, if we're looking at what one believes, that is part of the reality. There is an indivisible reality be between one's religious faith and the scientific uh, picture of the universe which has emerged. And how do you bring those two together? Well, this is indeed a big so. question, and you've done it actually very cleverly in the yeah. book. Let's look a little bit at your background, <laughs> first of all. When you, yeah. when you were young, you obviously you were yeah. brought up as a Christian, then you went to university at Oxford and you studied philosophy and history, and that must have triggered things in you then, didn't it, those times? Not really. Um, uh, I went, uh, like so many people, I was the first person in my family to go to university. My parents did not have much idea, I think, of what was going to flow from it, nor had I. Uh, and indeed, it was suggested to me I should go to LSE, and I can remember saying at the age of 20, 21, what is LSE? Uh, which shows how limited my understanding was outside the ancient world. And uh, I rapidly understood a lot when I went to LSE. I gained a, a political and social conscience, and I decided I would become a social worker, a probation worker, probation officer, working in the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, and I gradually moved from that to an understanding that one needed not just uh, to try and change individual lives, although that's extremely valuable and important, but to try and change the system which leads to the class injustice and the diminution and deterioration of opportunities of such a large part of our society. And that led me into politics. And I was fanatically interested in politics in the early years. I have to say I'm much more mellowed, not by my <laughs> values and principles, which yeah. remain as determined as they always were, but a realization of the limits of the political system and how in many ways it is deeply unsatisfying. And I found myself then asking questions, if I'm not satisfied by my political faith, is there something else in life which is fundamental, the ultimate, in which I can believe, something other greater cause beyond myself or beyond uh, the society around me, which is what it is really all about. Is there such a thing? And again, that led to the book. Yes, you were mm. elected as Labour MP for, for Oldham West in 1970. I think you were the joint longest-serving Labour Member of Parliament. And then mm. you were Minister for the Environment, weren't you, I think, for six years from 1997. So obviously at that point you started to take, take a real interest in environmental issues. Oh, I did. Um, I actually uh, shadowed eight departments in opposition in the Thatcher major years, so I know a lot about other departments, but the last one uh, was the environment, and it has, in some sense, always been my great love. I 
sometimes think Tony Blair put me there um, because he did not consider it very important. Uh, really? I, you, you feel that? I do. I yeah. do. I mean, let's be perfectly honest, I was never a Blairite. <laughs> Uh, I did not believe uh, in the political philosophy by which he changed the Labour Party, but that's another story. Uh, I did believe in the environment. I think it's, it's incredibly important. It is downplayed in this country compared to, for example, Scandinavia and many other parts of Europe, including even Germany, regards the environment as very important. So I felt that this was a, a, a great campaign to raise the environment in the public debate, to make people aware that the relationship between us and our biosphere, the ecosystem, the earth, which is our habitat as a species, is extremely important. And I think we did make some progress in that. And of course, climate change came along. I mean, yes. It's always been there, but it came up on the agenda. And I gave a lot of salience to it. Um, and I think we now have a very different attitude to our relationship with the environment, partly because of climate change, partly because of overpopulation, partly because of the overutilization of resources. For example, oil and water, which are major, major issues. So the book is divided into mm. different parts. And in mm. your introduction, you do stress that this was very much almost a personal mm. journey yeah. writing the book trying to get mm. the issues clear for yourself, mm. which I think is very admirable mm. to, to write a book, you know, not to make money and try and sell loads of copies, although mm. obviously you'd like that to happen as mm. well, <laughs> but to actually write it to clarify something yeah. for yourself. Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, I signed some books uh, last night uh, and I wrote in, this is a small contribution to the odyssey of transformation, because that's what it was for me. Um, and. I do think it's when you write something down uh, that you begin to clarify and hone and refine what it is you're really trying, sort of laser-like, uh, to achieve. <clears throat> I actually did make um, five attempts to write this book and abandon them before I finally settled on the structure which is now there. So there's got an enormous amount of uh, preparation and background uh, to the final result. And that, to me, was exceedingly useful. If no one ever read the book, I have no regrets. I'm still very pleased I wrote it because it's very meaningful to me, and I hope that it may make a small contribution to others. I <laughs> certainly found the book, mm. some of it is a lot of mm. dense information, but I found mm. the way you put it together mm. very interesting because the first section basically is different theories, I mm. think there's five basic theories that mm. you've come across about, what, about how the universe started in the mm. first place. And we don't mm. need to go into great detail about mm. all those five different mm. theories, but if you want to give us some of the important factors that you found there about the origin of the universe, the clues if you like. Well, I came to look at the book uh, in terms of well, what, what is the evidence on which one needs to reach a conclusion about why we're here, what it's all for, is there a purpose behind the universe? What is the evidence? And the evidence is obviously the origin of the universe, what we know about that, but then the evolution of the universe, uh, the development of the galaxies, uh, of our particular galaxy, our particular sun, which is one mainstream star amongst billions, and then the solar system around us, how the Earth came into existence, uh, all of which is a very, very interesting and remarkable story. And of course, how life in the extremely inhospitable conditions of the early conditions of the Earth four and a half billion years ago, how life started almost immediately, and how it evolved in a most extraordinary, haphazard and amazing fashion and ultimately uh, converged uh, on our species, as well as, of course, all the other species in the world. That is an amazing story, but it starts with the origin of the universe, and we really knew nothing about this until the 1920s um, and the 1930s, and in particular, Edwin Hubble, who was an, uh, an American astronomer, who discovered, totally contrary to Newtonian physics, that the universe wasn't a static place, it was ex extraordinarily dynamic, and indeed Einstein, of course, uh, theories of relativity had already indicated that, but he found for the first time in about 1929 that the galaxies, so far from being steady and static, were actually uh, moving away from each other at astonishing speeds. In other words, the whole universe was massively expanding. 
And if you wound back that process by using a particular variable called the Hubble constant, you could find or you can believe that the Earth began about 13.7 billion years ago. That's a very striking fact because, of course, uh, it's called the Big Bang um, and everything results from that. And the way in which the universe was constructed from that single point is, again, a very big indicator of what it is all about. So the origin of the universe, about which we've only known for less than 100 years, is extremely important. And also mm. the sheer size, some of the facts mm. you have in the book, that mm. the universe, although it's continued expanding, is actually mm. 100,000 light years across. Yes. I don't know how many miles that is, but that's a lot of miles. It is a lot of miles. 100,000 light years uh, may not mean much to most people. When I say a light year, it's just under 5.8 trillion miles. 5.8 trillion miles multiplied by 100,000. I mean, that, those are distances that are so vast we cannot... You understand the figures, but you cannot take in what it actually means. And what is really so staggering, we are one planet, there are eight planets in the solar system going around our sun, which, as I say, is one mainstream star in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, there are between 100 and 200 billion stars in our galaxy. And the most amazing fact of all is that there are, scientists are certain about this, about 100 billion galaxies. I mean, the, the, it is absolutely incredible, absolutely, utterly incredible how vast the universe is. And you have to pose the question, what is the significance of the human race against that background? That's a very profound question which I try to answer. And also, when it comes down to the chances of the universe actually happening the way it did, I think the lecture mm. last night I went to, the chances mm. of it actually happening were like mm. one followed by 123 noughts, yeah. is that right? Well, it is, um, uh, because not only did the universe start with uh, this cataclysmic explosion, but the, the balance between the outward explosive force of the original Big Bang and the gravitational pulling back uh, of the matter once it had been exuded from this uh, bang is exceedingly precise, exceedingly precise. Uh, if it had been one trillionth of one trillionth of one trillionth of a percent different from what it is, the universe would never have existed because either uh, the uh, the universe would have expanded so fast uh, that the galaxies never formed, or the gravitational forces would have been too great and it would have come back into a crunch. Uh, you would never have had that precise balance. Now, there are several other things. The particle masses which make up the universe, the strength of the four basic forces, the weak and strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, uh, and gravity, of course, uh, and the... Uh, the fundamental constants are all exceedingly exquisitely fine-tuned. And were they not exactly right, there wouldn't be a universe and there wouldn't, of course, be us. And Roger Penrose, who is, I think, probably the <coughs> most prominent uh, English mathematician of the time, said that the chances of this being random are one... Uh, in one followed by 123 noughts, which is what you're saying. And that is an unlikelihood verging on infinity. This cannot be chance. Uh, the only way the scientists who want to exclude any uh, deity or any ultimate agency are able to say this happened is, well, of course, this is just one universe, but there are zillions and zillions and zillions of other universes. We just happen to be in the one which is right for us. Well, if you believe that, for which there is not a shred of evidence. I mean, that is trying to explain something uh, by introducing uh, hypotheses that are so incredible that I think one can frankly dismiss it. It is designed in the, w in the most astonishing way. Now, whether that immediately points to a personal God, which is the subject of religious faiths, uh, all the different religious faiths believe in some kind of personal God, uh, is a matter of opinion. 
but what, a, what I think you cannot avoid is that it is designed in the most extraordinary, uh, exquisite, uh, and amazing way. As you were writing mm. this part of the book, what was happening inside you in terms of your feeling about how the universe came apart, came apart, came about? Did you get any, any clues? Did you get any feelings about what your belief is? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I didn't write the book in order to... I, mean, I wrote it as a sort of spiritual agnostic. I mean, yes. I do make that very clear yes, about what, what yeah. I mean by that. Is I've got my own views, but I'm not going to impose them on other people. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to say, I know what the truth is, <clears throat> and I'm telling you what the truth is. I have an unchallengeable certainty. I've had an experience which is so overwhelming, I know the truth. I've never had such an experience. I'm like the vast majority of people. Uh, I think about my experience, about what it means, and as I grow older, I get a sounder and deeper sense of it all. Uh, but I have not uh, had an experience which persuades me uh, that I know the ultimate truth. Uh, I don't. What I wrote it was to, uh, to be on all fours with what I think is the state of our <coughs> rather material, consumerist civilization, uh, in which spiritual values are, I think, um, increasingly uh, downgraded or marginalized. I think it's very sad, but that's where we are. So I wanted to start from that view and say, let's look at the evidence, the objective evidence. You accept science. Let's look at what the whole of the scientific evidence is uh, and see where that leads. Does it suggest a, a universe which is purposeful or one which is arbitrary uh, or as some of the physicists say driven by pitiless chance? What does the evidence actually show? Now, I didn't write it in order to say this is a way to religious faith, either for me or for anyone else. The, uh, the empirical physical evidence is such that you have to have a religious faith. I, I don't think it I don't think that works. I don't think it leads to that. But what it does lead to is that the scientific evidence so far from invalidating religion is totally and absolutely consistent with the fundamental religious message. Now, whether you take that further step, which is based on other criteria, uh, I mean, I think religion is validated not by scientific verification, but by the the sense of numinous power um, in sacred places, which was always the basis of uh, the views of earlier civilizations. The, the great message of the founders and prophets of the great religions, the ineffable witness of the mystics, and of course what I have been referring to, the overwhelming authenticity of personal experience when you have that. Those are the bases of religious faith. Uh, so I don't think you get from my book, if you read it, as I hope you will, to uh, a religious faith. What you will get uh, is a view that science and religion, so far from being incompatible, are deeply and profoundly symbiotic. They work together yes. and they illustrate each other. Yeah, and I think that's generally people accepting that these days, that science mm. and religion are meeting more and more ways. Yes. They used to be very, very much opposed to each yes. other in views. Yeah. I think another fascinating thing that I didn't quite realise when I read the book was the amount of change that has been, the amount of destruction that's been on the planet. There's been different life forms. I think mm. there's been four mm. substantial life forms mm. that have just been wiped out mm. and everything has started again. Mm. You mentioned um, the dinosaurs. I didn't realise they... They actually did last for, I think, 138 million years, was it? 165 million years. 165 million years. Whereas we've lasted about a quarter of one million years. Yes, <laughs> yes, and they got wiped out. And before yeah. that, there was various life yes. forms wiped yeah. out. Yeah. And then we obviously became the, the dominant life form um, mm. several hundred thousand years ago. Mm. And through that time, we've made a, a, gradual, a gradual step forward, a gradual process forward for a time and it's really accelerated the last few years. And one of the other, mm. other sections too, which I think ties into that, mm. is you do trace back the origin of the different religions. And I think, if I've got my dates right, there was evidence of religions in all the, all the major continents about, I think it was 5,000 years yeah. before Christ. Yes. It's interesting yeah. how in, in, in yes. these continents that weren't necessarily connected in terms yes. of 
people meeting each other, re yeah. religious thought and belief yeah. was emerging. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, taking the earlier point you made, it is true that there have been successive mass extinctions, at least five or six and possibly ten in the course of the history of the Earth. But exactly as you say, life then uh, starts again. There's uh, a niche which has been emptied by destruction and which is recycled into a new form. Uh, and life starts again, it's highly prolific, and it expands as long as it is compatible with the environment. That has happened uh, repeatedly. Now, in the last uh, 10, 15,000 years, since the end of the last ice age, uh, that we have seen the birth of civilizations and we have some recorded knowledge as you say, of about 5,000 years, um, there are artifacts um, and various other archaeological evidence from that period. And it seems very clear from the time of the Babylonian myths and other uh, civilizations that they uh, had a profound sense, as I say, of the of sacred places where there was a god. Uh, their concept of god was probably much more anthropocentric. They, they thought of god as a, a man like them who was very big and powerful. We have a very different view now, I think. Uh, but they had that sense. Uh, I mean, it, it's virtually universal and it is extremely significant. And of course, it then develops uh, in two or three key, three key parts of the world. Uh, and of course, particularly from a Christian point of view, uh, in Palestine, the great Jewish prophets leading to Christ. But then in the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad, uh, Confucius, uh, in the, the Yellow River and uh, the Chinese uh, mainland, uh, and of course to, uh, also in India. I mean, these are the great centers, but it is extraordinary, as you say, that none of them connected with each other. They all developed in a way consistent with their own culture, a belief that there is something more ultimate, greater uh, than man, uh, which is in some sense responsible for the universe and to whom they owed some kind of worship, to whom they owed some kind of respect, and who was the source of the better instincts that we have of, of love. That was the great message, not of uh, warriors and domination, but of love and concern for others. And it was the development of that idea was immensely powerful. It's basically a religious idea, but of course it also has implications for morality, even in the non-religious non sense. So there's this, there's something that's been inherent in man yes. for a long mm. time that's wanted to find. Mm probably the answers mm. that you're looking for mm. and are very similar, mm. very similar questions and they've found it more in religion and something mm. greater than them that's mm. guiding them. Mm. But you haven't actually gone that route in, in your own conclusion necessarily. You're still having this open mind. Uh, I probably have gone through that. I mean, I, I think it is relevant uh, today uh, because although we have material comfort, we have a, an advanced civilization, a reasonably mature democracy, uh, are we happy? Do we have fulfillment? That's a very different question because I think although all the other, the advance of technology, uh, the advance of um, uh, consumer materialism, uh, I think the degree to which we're enthralled to wealth and bling uh, and celebrity, uh, those are the uh, most significant features of our civilization. But I think there is an emptiness also, uh, which is very marked, which is greater than it was maybe 2,000 years ago. They had a much better sense of purpose and of meaning. We have very largely lost that. We're secularized. Uh, and I think there is a, a great void in many people and in the center of our civilization. And I think recovering that, which has always been there, as you say, is something that is very important. Science is seen as, as dismissing it, as unverifiable, uh, as uh, one notable uh, Richard Dawkins said, uh, there is almost certain, uh, there is probably not a god, so you can relax, uh, lie back and enjoy it. I think that is a profound profoundly wrong message. Uh, I don't think it is true, but even if it were true, it is not uh, the way to happiness and fulfillment and meaning and purpose. And that is ultimately, I think, what human life is about.
You, you mentioned in the book mm. the Gaia principle. James Lovelock mm. was the first person to, that I know that mm. talked about this and how the fact mm. that we are all connected mm. and the, the Earth is mm. one organism. And mm. unless we start to realise that and, and, and integrate mm. that into practically into our lives, mm. we're heading for big trouble. And I think that's in a way what you're hinting at too, isn't it? This, this, this kind of this emptiness we all feel, mm. we all, we all, we all feel at times. Mm. There's something missing, and of course, we, t we're, we're encouraged by society, Western society, to look for it in consumer goods and yeah. the outer world. Mm. But somehow, the answer doesn't actually lie there. Mm. The answer lies somewhere met inward, somewhere, somewhere deeper. Well, I certainly believe that. Uh, I passionately believe it. Uh, and I think it is everyone's odyssey in their own lives, their own experience, to find that way. Uh, but that is what I believe is right. But you mentioned the Gaia theory of Jim Lovelock. Um, what he is saying, um, as, as you repeated, that in some sense the Earth is not something passive there to be exploited, as industrialization and technology does. It is something which relates to us uh, and, the, and it is the health of that habitat on which our survival depends and which I have to say at the present time um, we are running pretty short where uh, if you like have an overdraft with the natural world um, but that is a, a wider uh, story. What, what Lovelock uh, found is that there is a relationship between animate, the animate world, us the living species and the inanimate world um, which and it is the relationship between those which uh, sustains the earth from the shocks which are continually being administered from outer space or from within the biosphere within the earth in which we live and that again is an amazing revelation and a, an extraordinary fact which suggests purpose rather than arbitrariness. There is plenty of other evidence. Um, what you indicated about fine-tuning and it being you know, so absolutely amazing it cannot be accidental. There is the fact of the early part of um, life forms on Earth uh, where again um, natural selection uh, since Darwin a hundred years ago we have thought that this is the way in which life has proceeded and undoubtedly natural selection of the survival of the fittest does have an impact uh, on what life uh, survives and what doesn't. But what Darwin did not take account of is environmentalism, the, the degree in which major changes on the environment profoundly affect uh, mass extinctions, uh, tectonic shifts in the Earth's crust, uh, the movement of the oceans, the change in massive changes of the temperature uh, and of the sea levels, all of those uh, are dramatically important. But what is really significant, again another discovery of the last um, 50 years, is that uh, the early life forms were not competing with each other in unnatural selection, they were symbiotic, they were living together, sharing a relationship, and that that relationship enabled the most profound change probably ever in the story of, uh, of life to happen. The movement from what are called prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus in them, and that change uh, from the original unicellular cells uh, to these multicellular cells, which included a nucleus, is an, a, an extraordinary and amazing event, the biggest event probably in the history of life. And that happened not through competition, it happened through uh, communal and cooperative uh, relationships between those very, very early primitive features. Again, a very significant fact when you look at how it is we came about. From listening to you talk about mm. this, it, it, I just get this feeling again, which um, is, is obvious in one way. We're losing our sense of balance as a, human, as a human race. We're taking and taking and taking, and we're taking because we want to try and fill this emptiness that we feel, mm. trying to fill a gap. Mm. And actually by doing that, we're upsetting a very delicate eco-balance. Mm. And we're, we're, unless we're careful, we're heading actually for quite a dramatic change, aren't we? And there has been... Again, in your book, you mm. do talk about um, not, only, not only certain species becoming extinct, but that's been through 
natural, so we, so, so we say natural causes, but mm -hmm. it'll be at our own mm -hmm. reasons we're going to become extinct mm -hmm. if we do become extinct. Mm -hmm. And it's also um, down to incredible lack of intelligence on our part. In one way, we, we have these brilliant brains, mm. brilliant capacity. We can do incredible scientific things, but we overlook the obvious, mm. which is sustainability mm. and our future and our mm. children's future. I, I think that is uh, profoundly right. Uh, we are uh, very clever. We're very intelligent. Um, we are certainly a unique species in terms of our intellect, our morality, our culture and our spirituality. Uh, and as I say, we're very clever. But are we wise? That is <laughs> a, a very different issue. And we are um, overdoing our stay on Earth. Um, if you destroy the habitat on which you depend, um, the species will not survive. 99% of all the species that have ever existed uh, have, have now become extinct. And there's no reason why that should not happen to us. And there are good reasons for thinking that we are driving in that direction. Um, first of all, the, the, the pressure of population. Um, it was about a billion in 1800. Uh, and we, uh, it took about 130 years to reach 2 billion, about 14 years only to reach 3 billion, 14 more years to reach 4 billion, 13 years to reach 5 billion, uh, 12 years to reach 6 billion, and we are probably heading towards 7 billion in 11 or 12 years. This is not sustainable, given that all of those human beings want the same kind of standard of life as we have in the US uh, and in Europe. And that is impossible. And the pressure on the Earth's resources, because of that colossal in, uh, tenfold increase in population, in only 250 years, which is a tiny amount of time. And the pressure on, on the resources is absolutely overwhelming. The, the Earth is amazingly bountiful, but the diversity and plurality and availability of it in, in terms of essential resources is limited. And we are pressing at those limits extremely hard. Our civilization is basically an oil civilization. We need it for industry, we need it for industrial agriculture, we need it for transport, uh, and I have to say we need it for warfare. Uh, and we've used half of it. It took hundreds and hundreds of millions of years for that oil and gas uh, to form. Uh, we've used half of it in 150 years. And given the increase of exploitation and uh, extraction of the oil and gas, it is generally reckoned that oil will only last another 40, 50 years. It'll gradually plateau down and then it'll drop quickly. Um, and what is going to happen then? Uh, what kind of civilization will we have if the most fundamental uh, element which has produced the productivity of the last 150 years uh, is suddenly no longer available? Another, of course, is water, which is the most significant factor of all. Uh, and the increasing demand because of the rise in population, so dramatically huge, and the increasing lack of availability of potable, clean, purified water, partly with the disappearance of the ice sheets because of climate change, is another uh, real issue. And there are many others. We've virtually eliminated the fish stocks in many parts of the world. Um, we, and the, the use of some of the essential uh, elements of our civilization, giving us the material comforts, are also being pressed uh, to the point where they're becoming quite scarce. So we are really pushing on its limits. It's climate change, it's overpopulation, and it's overuse of the Earth's resources. And I don't know how long it'll be, but I very much doubt if it is more than two to three hundred years and possibly considerably less when there is going to be a very substantial population crash because the Earth simply cannot sustain uh, the way in which we conduct our civilization. And we need a profound change, an understanding that our whole survival depends on that relationship with the environment and that we are behaving towards it in a way which is irresponsible, criminally, and stupidly irresponsible, and we need a fundamental change. Now, we are clever enough to understand that. 
The question is whether we're willing to make that change, since most of us are very unwilling to shift away from something which is comfortable and easy and which you're used to. But we have got to. Uh, we have a financial and economic crash. At the, that is going to be dwarfed by the size of the risks which we are now running. And the question for human beings, I think, is are we going to wait for the cataclysm which is going to force us to change, or are we going to have the intelligence and the wisdom to draw back and change before that actually happens? I think you actually mentioned in the last chapter of your book that by the year 2050, which is 40 years uh, away, mm. we're going to need 2.3 billion planets, sorry, 2.3 planets to yeah. actually mm. have the lifestyle that we have now. So mm. it seems that this is all going to happen fairly quickly. I'm wondering, do you see positive signs? Do you feel that there are elements where people are starting to realise this and do something about it? Yes, I do. I, I don't think we should be uh, pessimistic in the sense of uh, it's doom and gloom, it's all over. We're, we're all, you know, uh, uh, some people might see me as a Jeremiah. I don't think that. I think it is very important to say it as it is, as one perceives it to be, and others can look at it themselves and may reach a different conclusion, but I don't think they will. Uh, and in the light of that, uh, I think there is a very real possibility of change. Climate change, for example, in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, okay, there are climate change deniers, and there are countries, particularly the United States before Obama, who were unwilling to do anything about it. All of that has changed. There is a, an understanding that carbon emissions are a very serious risk to the survival of the planet. Um, I think this question of overpopulation is a very difficult one, um, extremely difficult one, but I think there is an awareness that there must be a limit uh, to human populations which are sustainable. Uh, on terms of uh, the availability of energy, the availability of resources, I think our uh, understanding of that is still fairly limited. Uh, I note that governments across the world are very unwilling to talk about peak oil. I mean, it's extraordinary that the idea that we have probably were either at or possibly have even passed the point at which the Earth has produced the maximum amount of oil per year that it ever will, the implications of that given its importance to our civilization, our way of life. You would expect there to be a massive public debate. There hasn't been. So all of this is still to come. But I think you give a mass communication, given globalization, given the degree to which we are now one global village, and ideas in one place spread very rapidly across the world, I think there are good reasons for thinking we may well draw back in time. But don't overestimate human greed, human aggression, and this drive for power and dominance and competitiveness. That, I feel, is extremely destructive. One thing, mm. we were talking about this briefly before we started the interview, that I feel is that there's a lot of people mm. that are really very open to what you're saying, and they're people from all walks of life. They realise, I think it was the financial the almost financial crash that happened a mm. couple of years ago, that shocked a lot of people. Mm. They thought, well, the banks would go on forever, and when mm. the government had to prop up the banks, not mm. only here, but around the world, mm. that's when people thought, gosh, this whole thing is not as stable as we thought. And it seems that people, they're willing to change, but they want what they feel is honest, credible mm. leadership. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, mm. in my mind as well, we're lacking now. Maybe, maybe the leaders are below the, below the radar mm. point at the moment, and we haven't, we haven't mm. quite, they haven't quite emerged as leaders. But we need, we need new leaders to see things yeah. in new ways. And I'm not saying that necessarily that shouldn't be via parliament. I'm not talking about anything necessarily completely radical. Mm. But do you, from where you are, and you, you, you know, you're, you're on the leading edge of many of these things. Do you feel there are these new leaders that are going to emerge? I don't know. I hope uh, that is the case, but I have to say, uh, far more in sadness uh, than anything else, I'm very disappointed with the lack of leadership that exists across the world on these issues. Uh, obviously, political leadership is key, but there is a media uh, leadership or lack of it. Uh, and as I say, there are many other walks of life 
uh, who could be providing that leadership. Uh, it really isn't forthcoming. And from a political point of view, uh, I'm really distress the degree in which uh, elections are fought in a very narrow prism. I mean, what we've been talking about didn't emerge in the election. That's right. It, yeah. it, it didn't emerge, it, it doesn't emerge in any election it wasn't anywhere. Any, it wasn't any of those three big debates, was it? It didn't Absolutely. come up. Not, not, not even remotely. Uh, it is all about uh, how uh, my party, how I, as the leader of my party, can actually assist you to maintain your way of life, to do it as cheaply and efficiently as possible, to make you better off. That is completely the wrong paradigm. It is completely ignoring uh, the actual state of the world. And I, I sometimes despair. I'm not a, I am actually probably more an optimist than a pessimist. I always assume uh, that there is uh, an opportunity for change and for things to get better. And I do think that. But uh, I have to say there is very little sign of it. And one of the things that I do, it's not just the political leaders, it's all of us. I mean, it's not just that they're feeble, they're failing us, and if only we had good leaders, we'd be all right. It, we've got to look at ourselves. Are we actually prepared, if you get that sort of message, to change? I mean, if you have one political leader who is saying the kind of things I'm saying, would that, certain, would that person be elected? I mean, that, that's a, a very open question. What is people's reaction going to be? Or will they say, goodness me, uh, I, that sounds pretty depressing to me. I want to carry on as I, as I am. And that's the problem for political leadership. It, you have to be prepared to take a risk that honesty and credibility and frankness and transparency is incredibly important but it requires immense bravery in a political leader to show it. Now, as the situation gets worse, and I think it will with climate change, I think the willingness to take that risk uh, will be greater because more people will realize that there is an inevitability in this, and therefore when we hear a political leader saying these things, we don't just dismiss it uh, as someone who is saying things we just don't want to hear and we utterly reject and vote them down, we actually begin to think, well, maybe this is going to happen, we've got to face up to it, and what is the best way of doing it? And I think that will gradually happen. I just hope that it happens in a time scale which averts a final catastrophe. And on that, I think the verdict is still out. You see, at the end of the day, the way I look at it is, people basically want to be happy. Um, at the moment, the way society is driven from the media and all kinds of sides is that happiness is having extra. It's having a better car, a, mm. a bigger house, mm. basically more money, nicer holidays, mm. all the rest of it. Mm. And if people don't get something like that, they think, well, that's their chance of happiness being taken away. Mm. So we're going mm. back to something we talked about midway mm. through the interview. Mm. It's like, it's almost as if somehow people have to be encouraged not, 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 not to necessarily let go of everything on the outside mm. because it's having a decent standard of living is important to everybody but on the other hand the answer has to somehow to find happiness be mm. within and unless, unless we're able to do that we are actually going nowhere at all because we're using up more mm. and more of the outside mm. and probably getting more and more desperate mm. because, because that feeling of happiness and completeness mm still doesn't come. I, I agree with that. I, th I think that's exactly right. Um, we use uh, materialism, uh, the, the, the enormous range of technologically clever goods, every must-buy every Christmas, iPhones, iPads, uh, all of these things we must have. Uh, are they necessary? Well, they're useful. I don't think they're necessary. Uh, does it make one happy? Certainly not. It does uh, provide an increased facility. It is useful. Uh, human beings uh, have great agility in invention, and we will continue to take advantage of that. And that's fine. Uh, it's a great thing. But the idea that that deals with the fundamentals uh, which the human condition is all about, I think is profoundly wrong. And it is indeed within us. It is interesting that we are beginning to change even on that. There are books recently on the economics of happiness, uh, which I think is 
uh, initially, I think it was regarded as a bit of a joke. Partly you can't measure it, but increasingly we are saying if you uh, spend money in certain ways, does it make people more happy? Or does it actually increase competitiveness between people, between the haves and the have-nots? Does it, it, does it lead to division in society? Should we be looking at ways to achieve social cohesion? Is harmoniousness in society likely to make us feel better of ourselves than having a bigger car, a better holiday, a helicopter which other people haven't got? Uh, and I think this idea is growing. People know deep within themselves that we need each other. The relationships are incredibly important. And to have an underclass uh, and to have a, a develop, uh, developing world which you know, a million is uh, a billion, or is it two billion people who live on less than two dollars a day? I mm. mean, it's just incredible. Is that the kind of world which is going to be stable, uh, which is not going to be aggressive uh, because of their demands against us? They're wanting immigration into our country. They want a sharing of goods. Is this the way to run a planet uh, in a way which is actually going to? Uh, be sustainable and make us happy. And I think more and more people come to see that we have a greater opportunity to change that now than there ever has been in human history. The level of wealth, the level of technology, the level of uh, capability for change is greater than it ever has been. So there is a fantastic beckoning to the future uh, for a better world. It's just there has to be also the will. That is what is so often lacking. Yes, and it, it's that will that mm. I was talking about. The leaders aren't necessarily appearing at the moment, the new leaders. But if, if the will from the people is strong enough, I'm sure the leaders will appear. And, and, uh, will appear. and the, I went, the lecture I went to last night, Alternatives, where you were talking, was called Change Yourself, Change the World, mm. which I think is very pertinent. And I wondered if you have any, we have about three or four minutes left, any sort of more specific pointers where people can change themselves in order to change the world? I don't think there is a glib answer to that question. Um, I've had an odyssey which has gradually transformed me and uh, other people will find their own. It depends on their experience, their situation, um, their background. Uh, but I think it is extremely important to think about one's life, uh, what it means, where it is leading, uh, how things could be different. Uh, and to look for movements, it could be political parties, it could be voluntary bodies, community organizations, which uh, will begin to lead in a rather different direction. That the people really believe in, that they want to give their time, their resources to, uh, because they can see it's valuable. It has a fundamental innate value. That is what people are looking for. And I think uh, as we have got greater wealth, there is more opportunity to do this than there ever has been. Um, and I think this is a very slow progress. It has to come, as you say, from the grassroots. Uh, political leaders love to think of themselves as being in the vanguard and leading the nation forward and they have a vision. Well, uh, I think that's... Um, <laughs> Uh, pretty optimistic. Uh, in my view, the vision of the leaders is rather dependent on what the polls are saying uh, about how well they're doing and whether people approve of this, that and the other. I think there's very little sense of uh, an ulterior vision and a, you know, the big picture of where we're going. And I think change comes from us, from the base. And uh, there, there is much more uh, discussion and number of books that are written every year is, is absolutely enormous. There is television or a multiple channel. There is tremendous flow of information and discussion. And I think it's having a selection of that uh, which enables you to pick out uh, the key points which may be for you uh, the, the way forward. Uh, we all have nodal points in our life when we can look back and think, well, that really changed it. I can think of those in, in my life, and other people do. And it's looking at the significance of that and how you build on it and give time to developing those things. See, I think time management is very important. It's extremely important to me, and I think it is to other people. Are you actually spending your life other than the fact that you've got to work and you've got to earn a living, and of course that's very important, but are you spending your life 
in the way which is most valuable, which is going to give value not only to you but to others, which ultimately will increase satisfaction. And I think just to think about that, and to begin to change your life in that direction. If people did it on a very big scale, I think there would be the beginnings of profound change. No, I think you're absolutely right. And just one thing I remember just briefly was that the way the whole GM mm. food thing yes. took off, and I know you, you were part of that because yeah. you did try and introduce a private member's bill on that, yeah. on that issue, yeah. but it was people just going to supermarkets and saying, mm. I don't want to buy this GM exactly. food. And that moves so fast. Exactly that the supermarkets wouldn't yeah. stock it. Almost in a, yeah. in a question of months, the whole GM yeah. food thing yeah. was, was a huge issue and something changed. Yeah. And it's almost as if that has to happen again. Yeah. People just say, no, yeah. we're not prepared to do this anymore. You're absolutely right. And when that happens, yeah. leadership will come. I think, that, I think that is right. We underestimate our own power. Uh, because it's not only I'm thinking like this, one has to remember an awful lot of other people are feeling the same way. And it's not just a matter of opposing, although I think that is very important, uh, whether it's um, uh, over, over GM and the desire for organic foods, um, whether it is over uh, many issues, for example, uh, the need to move to renewable sources of energy and not fossil fuels. I think if we decided not to use uh, fossil fuels or, or to diminish that use, we would bring about change much more quickly. But we do also have to have a positive sense, a positive vision. And I think much more public discussion uh, about that. This is not an issue which people find easy. It's always the latest invention, the latest fashion, the latest bit of bling, the latest bit of celebrity. I think that's extremely shallow. We need to think much more about the ultimates, about what society is for, what we are struggling to achieve, what will produce a lasting happiness for us and for others. If we had much more discussion of that, I think it would be very, very helpful. Michael, it's been very stimulating. Thank you very much for coming along. I'd really like to recommend you read Michael Meacher's book, Destination of Species. It's a great read and it will stimulate you and, uh, and hopefully we can, uh, we can move forward in a positive way. Thank you for watching Conscious TV and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.